Okay, thank you everyone and welcome to our today's session. My name is Harun Madena Miesi. I'm from resident of Kilifi County, but currently in Nairobi. I'm the co-founder of Global Peace Champion, which is just a community of peace builders, uh, co-founded on 2020 with members from the Bosch Alum Network with an aim of mobilizing peace champions across the globe so that we can promote the um, the cross-border collaboration and, and cross-pollination of idea through holding this kind of a high-level dialogue discussion and, and, and roundtable discussions. Also, I'm the managing director and founder of Collaborative Approach Consultancy, which is a consultancy aiming work with young people, major, mainly the youth leaders, not only from Kenya, but from East and Horn of Africa. Today's session, we are privileged to have different partners from different organizations who will help us to answer some of the key questions through the kind of a panel discussion. The topic for today's session will be the future of Kenya Kwanzaa government foreign and regional policy. We have Mr. Christopher, uh, Christopher Hockey from Rusi. Christopher, uh, later on, he will introduce himself, full names, and more about terms than we engage in our in our in our engagements. Also, we have uh, Professor Masharia from the Horn of Institute. Also, he will introduce himself in detail and and engage in our in our discussion. Then, lastly, we have Akiar Malim. We'll join as a speaker also from the Institute for Strategic Dialogue uh, for, in, uh, for our panel discussion. So uh, our session format is very simple. We have some set of questions which will act like a guiding question and we'll do in a form of a panel discussion. Each speaker will be given maximum of 10 to 15 minutes to engage with that question. Then we will open this session to all participants to either ask question or to engage uh, with, speaker, with speakers in an open way. We, we are planning to spend a maximum of 1.5 hours and end this session at 6.30 if possible. So thank you so much and you're most welcome. So our first speaker is Professor Masharia. Professor Mashori, are you with us? Yes, I'm with you. Oh, Professor Mashori, thank you so much. You are most welcome to our today session. Allow me to post to you this question. Give me some few minutes, sorry. So allow me to post you to this question. In light of the planned collaboration between Africa Union and Global Center for Adoption. Do you think states within East and, and Horn of Africa region have the capacity to help finance the, uh, the USAID 25 billion for Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program? So Professor, uh, feel free to you. introduce yourself. Where are you using from? Brief about you, then engage yourself with this question. Most welcome. You know, thank you very much for the question and uh, the discussion. First, the name is Masharia Molena. I'm a professor at the United States International University where I teach international relations and uh, related matters. Um, and um, I've been here for some time. And I'm also associated with the Horn, of, uh, Horn Institute, uh, very close uh, collaboration with Horn. Um, with me, I have some visitors who wanted to uh, see what's going on. <laughs> so it should show that they have in a boardroom. <laughs> so that. Now, your question is um, whether the Horn, no, 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 the Horn of Africa and the Eastern Africa, and generally the African continent, is able or capable of uh, meeting, uh, meeting its. Uh, uh, expected contribution to the issue of um, the climate change and uh, the global center for adaptation, uh, whether it will be able to adapt 
is the thing. I think there is a willingness to do it. The capacity is another matter. Given that um, many of our countries have problems meeting their own basic needs in the first place. And there are problems even um, uh, meeting other obligations within the region, eh? like um, the, the East African community or the IGAD or whatever. The obligations that also we have more opportunities for questions later on. Hello. Sorry, proceed. Oh, okay. So there was an interference. Um, so the willingness is there and people can see the dangers. The capacity is another matter. And I guess that's why we have this issue being addressed as a joint effort, not just from the African perspective, but also from the global perspective, because those people who have messed up the climate and the environment uh, are the ones with the capacity to do things. Uh, those who are victims of the messing up, uh, then being expected to do something, they have a challenge. So the willingness is there, the ability may be something else. <clears throat> so I continue, okay. Now, this brings up the issue of what, what one time somebody wrote a paper, the tragedy of the commons. Eh? We have that issue in Eastern and Horn of Africa region, exactly who takes the responsibility and who leads in that undertaking. Because sometimes there is a tendency of people and countries to look up to somebody else to do it, whereas some of them they are just joyride or see that if somebody else is going to do it, then they don't bother too much. And when it comes to that, it's going to cost you directly. The direct cost is also a hindrance to some places, some countries who may actually have survival problems, challenges. And so when they are told to cough up resources to deal with a common problem, then you have um, some reservations or people, countries start looking for excuses as to why they cannot do it. For instance, if you look at um, Kenya and its neighbors, it has, uh, the neighbors have a lot of problems. You do not expect Somalia to be coughing up things when it is an occupied country by so many <laughs> horses in the place. And it is uh, a bigger country in that sense. The headquarters of the AU, Ethiopia. Yes, it says this should be done. But Ethiopia is going through a, such a rough time, both in terms of chaos, manufactured chaos in war, or the environment itself. That's why it is in that desperate condition to be able to do something it may want to. And I think I've seen the president of Ethiopia, uh, President Zudi, so is talking about this thing. But the capacity becomes another different problem. Sudan and Southern Sudan. Sudan itself, Khartoum, has a lot of problems uh, in terms of weather, climate. It's a dusty place. And uh, South Sudan is having problems because they are fighting over power in the whole thing. So they, they have the resources and the time to put what needs to be done. When you go to the Great Lakes, the Eastern, because now Eastern Africa community includes the Great Lakes. What do we have there? Major war taking place. We have quarrels among the neighbors. And will they then have the time and the resources to do what needs to be done in order to meet that expectation? You have that challenge. And uh, Kenya, of course, would like to say that it is willing and able and put its little, whatever resource it has, being the headquarters, the world headquarters for environment, then it feels that it has an obligation to be seen to deliver. Um, how much can it deliver is another matter because it is not a one country thing. It is a 
joint thing, and the problem comes in the word joint, because not everybody can deliver on their expectations. Let me stop there for now. Thank you so much, Professor Masharia, for sharing some, some of your key insights and thoughts. And, and from your engagement, it's true that countries from East and Horn of Africa are facing major challenges at the, at the national level, ranging from political instability, issues of war, and some of the, of the high uh, climate crisis issues, which means that most of the resources will be focusing at the, at the national level. And the question is, will they engage themselves? Will they finance all these questions? So thank you so much for engaging this, um, to this conversation. My next, set, my next speaker is Akiar. Akiar, you're most welcome to, our, to our today's session. And our question is, will the new government mirror the previous government regional, regional foreign policy posture? I repeat again, will the new government mirror the previous government regional foreign policy posture? So Akar, feel free to introduce you and them, uh, where you are using from the organization you're representing and engage this question. Most welcome, you have 10 minutes. Uh, thank you, Harun. Hi, everyone. My name is Akar Maalim. I work with the Institute for Strategic Dialogue and uh, a project called SCN, um, Strong City Network. And we are implementing a project called ProAct in three counties. Um, currently in Nakuru doing some work. So that's where I'm zooming from, but I'm based in Nairobi. Uh, fun fact, Professor Masharia is my former professor and he taught me international law at USAU. So it's an honor to share this platform with him. And yeah, so thank you, Harun. And to answer your question, Just a moment. Um, so, uh, since independence, um, it, the foreign policy, Kenyan foreign policy has evolved to accommodate the changing trends in the world affairs. Um, so, as President Ruto takes office, it's important to, re to remember that regime change doesn't necessarily lead to radical shift in Kenyan's foreign policy, as we have seen um, during Uhuru's time and Kibaki. So if you look at the Uhuru's regime, the foreign policy didn't change significantly, but he, he mostly focused on the economic part of it. But what changed was the style, strategies employed and ordering the, the external partners and relationship. Um, for example, the former president was more hands-on in execution and advancement of the Kenya core interests at the international level than Mo the late Moikibaki. Um, he, he ensured continuity in expanding Kenya national wealth through economy, economic diplomacy as, as the core of Kenyan foreign policy agenda. Kenya also improved Kenyan security interests through aggressive response to terror attacks despite challenges. Um, yeah. So um, we'll... Will the new government mirror or will it change? I don't think anything will much will change. Probably the style and execution and the strategies will change. Um, but I think the new government should actually focus on or continue um, the work that has been done by the outgoing government, um, like to maintain the foreign policy uh, of the high diplomacy level visits like the Pan-Africanism, aggressive foreign policy, uh, where Kenya didn't uh, stop itself or didn't hesitate to bid for any opportunities in the international system. And you can see how we lobbied for the UN Sec uh, Security Council chair, um, just end of the two years. Um, sorry, there's background noise. Yeah, thank you. Um, but however, there should be a change in approaches so that the um, so that Kenya does not appear as a transactional with its relation with other states. More, we should adapt a give and take strategy or a win-win strategy. Uh, we should be de deliberate on our participation and enhancement of inter-Africa trade beginning with our neighboring countries, which um, the Reuters government should actually review and write a uh, foreign policy document of 
of the outgoing government, specifically to revamp and improve the cultural diaspora diplomacy, securing partnership for the safety of the Kenyan workers in the Middle East. I think we've all seen the horror uh, stories in, on Twitter and social media. Um, we should focus on labor agreements should be anchored in the Momera, Mom, Momera, sorry, memorandum of understanding at the bilateral level uh, before Kenyans are left to perish in the Middle East. And I think um, the embassies we have in those countries should have access to Kenyans and review the compliance with this term. Um, furthermore, the government should redirect the foreign policy to explore trade and employment opportunities for Kenyans in other countries like Sudan, Tanzania, UAE, Canada, and other untapped area uh, countries or states in the region. But I think they should continue with a gradual infusion of change to adapt to the trends and the changes that are coming up like climate change, violent extremism and other issues um, that are affecting the country like their Ukraine and, uh, and Russian conflict and how it has impact on the global uh, economy. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Akiar, for sharing uh, your, your insight, thoughts, and suggestion on this topic, and we highly appreciate it. Indeed, uh, it's true that uh, the Kenya Kwanza should try to focus more and see how best they, they can <laughs> strategize the issue of Middle East and develop a kind of uh, labor agreement to address uh, uh, some of these issues uh, from the Middle East. So our next speaker, before we open up the question and answer session, allow me to welcome Mr. Uh, Mr. Christopher from Rusi. And Mr. Christopher, you're most welcome. And here we have a question for you. The question is more of, the question is more of what are your thoughts on Kenya reason to skipping mission? And do you think that the Kenya Kwanzaa is so effective in addressing some of these counterterrorism issues from the, from the domestic part of it at the national level and to the regional level? As an expert within this peace building sector, as an expert within this counterterrorism sector, what's your, what's your opinion? Please, you're most welcome and share your analysis, your thoughts, and some of the basic recommendations. Most welcome. Thank you very much, Aaron. Um, so to introduce myself, my name is, as, as Aaron said, Christopher Hockey. I'm a research fellow with, uh, with Rusi and in the Nairobi office, and I focus mainly on, on countering violent extremism. Um, so foreign policy is a, a little bit outside of, of that area of expertise, but I hope um, I can I can provide some useful thoughts on on the priorities for the for the new for the new government. But to start with your your, your question here and around around the DRC. So just yesterday, Parliament approved um, the deployment of KDF uh, to to the DRC, um, and they could move as soon as as soon as this weekend, which is which is pretty rapid. Um, and that these forces, uh, in theory, will will be present in in DRC as part of the East Africa Standby Force, which is a an initiative which has been sort of 10, 15 years in the making. Um, but the nature of the engagement in, um, in in the DRC is still a little bit unclear. The sort of rules of engagements uh, aren't, aren't entirely clear to everyone. But I think it's it's important to note that this this deployment isn't entirely um, based on on a counterterrorism initiative, it's more broadly trying to counter all the many different um, groups that are active in, in the Kivus and in Eastern DRC. Um, I think Kenya also sees this as part of broader efforts to incorporate DRC into, in, into the AC, into the East African community more thoroughly and to, and to therefore protect future Kenyan investments in the, in the region. Um, but there's a lot of concern over the expense of, of this operation um, amongst a lot of MPs. Um, uh, and I think there's going to be it, it, it's it's concerning to many that Kenya is about to enter potentially a second war zone, given the the sort of concerns over the the first intervention in in Somalia. But if it's all right, Harun, I'll sort of move on to a few a few broader issues around uh, if it's okay with you around around I think Kenya Kwanzaa priorities. Um, so I think a couple of recent 
early events uh, in, in Ruto's presidency uh, provide some interesting indicators on the priorities of, of this new government in the international community. Firstly, just yesterday, Ruto, uh, present at COP27 in, in Egypt, gave a really sort of inspiring interview to, to, a, to an international reporter uh, on Africa's role in, in, in climate change moving forward. And I think that that sort of says two things um, that are, are dem demonstrative of, 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 of his, his foreign policy over the next five years. One, his focus on climate change, it's come up twice now. Um, and secondly, his focus on, on Africa as a priority for, for everything he, he does. Um, and a second one is sort of a bit more concerning was very, very early on in, after he was sworn in, he met with envoys from, from Morocco and then made what I saw as a little bit of a, a rash decision to, to sort of um, stop recognizing Western Sahara, which seemed to me as a pretty insignificant uh, decision, but I think was sort of made very quickly. But on the other hand, it could be seen as particularly pragmatic in, in light of the fact that relations with Morocco are much more important than than perhaps Kenya's Kenya's position on on Western Sahara. So I think, as uh, Akia just said, that there might not be that much change in this new this new um, administration. What we uh, Ruto has been, you know, active in 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 formulating the the foreign policy this country has followed for the last eight years. So you know, the priorities will likely remain economic, not necessarily political. Um, but we need to ask whether. Uh, you know whether the name Kenya Kwanza itself is 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 illustrative of of the nature of this coalition, uh, of, of this coalition's um future foreign policy. I think Kenya will always come first before anything else. There then will be consideration for the wider region, and then after that, a focus on Africa, and only then sort of a a concern over over sort of relationships with with the West or with with China in the East. Um, to highlight a few things in the in the manifesto. He, the manifesto, um, Kenya Kwanza manifesto focuses on Kenya as, as an anchor state for Eastern Africa. It also focuses on uh, the importance of, of, of Nairobi as a hub for the for international community. Um, it talks about um, the, the need to, for, for friendly friendliness with neighbors um, and, and Kenya's role as a sort of an, a leader on the African continent. And, and it identifies sort of four pillars. Um, one, economic and commercial diplomacy, which is clearly the priority. Secondly, the anchor state issue. Thirdly, Kenya's role as a, as a member of lots of international organizations, what he calls global citizenship. And finally, the role in the diaspora, which we've just heard Akia speak about as well. Um, but I think in, in sort of much more tangible terms, there are several massive issues that he's gonna have to deal with in the next five years. Um, starting with with the security sphere, there's obviously three re three countries in our in our region that are uh, currently at war in in one capacity or another. So South Sudan, the DRC, and Somalia. Uh, can, and I think Ruto and Kenya Kwanza more broadly are very keen on Kenya being a, a seen as a peacemaker in all of these conflicts, um, which obviously is has not been in Somalia to date. Um, the, perhaps more than anything else in his in his next five years, the the uh drawdown of of atmos of the african union forces in in somalia is due in late 2014 um as part of the somali transition plan uh so that's going to happen during ruto's uh, presidency his first term uh, and that will be really 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 critical how he deals with that and how he obviously deals with the very immediate security threat on kenya's border with somalia it already seems that he's trying to form stronger relationships with hassan sheikh mohammed in 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 mogadishu um based on trade and investment but in the longer term there may need to be sort of a reconsideration of, of how kenya deals with with jubaland and, and its relationship with uh, agman madobi in 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 kismayo um but it does seem that ruto has a very clear idea and kenya kwanza have a dedicated strategy for the northern frontier regions as they call them uh, and that's quite encouraging the other issue with Somalia is obviously the maritime border, so that's going to be a concern for for many over the next five years. Perhaps it's not that important to to most individuals, but in terms of relations with Somalia, it will be critical. And as I said, obviously Ethiopia, he's already invested resources in that. Uhuru already being the the uh, helping out in in the in mediating those discussions, and in DRC, um, as Kenya clearly wants to invest more in 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 um, in the Congo and to um, encourage uh, 
Kenyan businesses to expand there, then um, its role in this current peacekeeping force will be very important. I won't talk too much about the regional role that I think um, uh, beyond beyond that. Um, the, the president has spoken a lot about Kenya's role as a sort of the powerhouse, the political powerhouse in the region. Um, but what is a real worry is that the trade wars continue and the EAC clearly is not working for many people. Um, there's trade wars with Uganda and Tanzania in the last in the last few years. Um, and I think ultimately, if if Kenya is going to play a role in is the sort of central uh, central trade role in, in the EAC, then that needs to become a priority. Um, needs to be a workable solution to make the EAC something actually more more tangibly useful through maybe a um, you know, the common market, for example. Um, further afield, it seems that he's keen to to work more closely with with the more powerful states in, um, in Africa, so Egypt, Nigeria, and South Africa in particular. Um, but if we take a step back even more to to, to finish here, um, to speak about some of the major issues that Ruto needs to deal with. Uh, on the international sphere. Firstly, obviously, the Russia-Ukraine issue, which has come up um, already today. Um, it seems that at some point there may be uh, many in the in the global south will be asked to make decisions on who they're siding with uh, as these blocks form. And I think it's important that Kenya avoids doing that for as long as possible, if it can. Um, there's also, I've heard rumors that suggestion that Ruto may consider you know, buying Russian oil, and I think that would be a, a very problematic decision if that was the case. Um, in terms of the West versus the East, if you like, and, and there was a fear that, a feeling that, uh, you know, uh, at the beginning of Uhuru's time that we would, in Kenya, turn turn eastward potentially due to, to strains, but that didn't seem to be the case at all. Um, and I think Kenya needs to navigate those relationships to, to make sure we can get the best out of both sides. The priority needs to be on, on ensuring debt is manageable, um, on trade, not aid, as, as the Kenya Kwanzaa Manifesto itself, I think, puts it. And maybe to uh, uh, be very aware constant, constantly at this time of the sort of changing world order. Um, Ruto has said he's willing, he's, he's willing to borrow less from China, which is, I think, maybe a positive. Um, climate change, I've already spoken about. He, Ruto spoke extensively about that also at the General Assembly. But just to conclude, I think the, the, the key point is that Kenya's foreign policy moving forward is going to be based on, on economic decisions more, more than anything else. Um, about opportunities outside of Kenya's borders for, for business, as I said, in the EAC particularly, but maybe also in other new areas like Eastern Europe. And uh, major, major issues. And some of the major, major issues which we should focus and trigger more discussion. I can see the issue of, of, of Russia stroke, stroke, stroke Ukrainian situation. It's a reminder, yeah, and it's clear that or we need to trigger more question like, where should the Kenya Kwanzaa position themselves? Should they position themselves from, from the Western side or from the, uh, for the Russian side? Should the Kenya Kwanzaa adopt the stop and wait diplomacy? And if it's, if, and if it's how effective it is. So thank you so much. And I feel like there's need of more of discussion to, to trigger more and, and bring more of the recommendation. Now, before I post one of the common question, which was asked by participants who register, I'd like to open this session to majority of you uh, who are in this. If you'd like to engage with us, if you'd like to engage with the participants, feel free to post your question via the box or feel free to raise you, your hand and we will nominate you uh, to engage with our speakers and general participants. So this session now, it's open to all participants. Feel free to help and engage with us. Hi, Harold. Uh, thank you so much. Welcome, good to, and good to see you. I was worried I wasn't gonna make it on time. Um, yeah, but I'm here. So my, I just wanted Christopher to probably speak on uh, the issue because he touched on the issue of debt management 
and also pointed out that the foreign policy, it will be focusing more on economic decision as opposed to political decisions. And so it will be interesting to just hear from his perspective on the issue of debt management. And I know he also talked about um, us uh, not going more to China. So, so it's a question of debt management versus the question of austerity measures and structural adjustment programs, especially because uh, increasingly, we've seen how the economic uh, situation is. Thanks, Ro Rose. Was it sorry? Was it Rose? I think it was Rose. Um, Anne, Anne Rose. Sorry. Uh, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Polly. Um, yeah. No. Firstly, I want to caveat anything I say with the fact that I'm not a, I'm not an economist. Um, so some of those questions, some, some of that question is, you know, it's quite difficult for me. I'm, I'm a more of a security and political analyst, but I think the, the, the point is that Ruto's kind of suggested during his, during the campaign period that he would maybe move away from borrowing so much from China, not necessarily maintaining relationships with China, but at least, at least borrowing more from China, whether that's possible, I, I think is is unlikely. I think there may need to be if not not many people are currently willing to to lend. Um, so that may make make it quite challenging for him. Um, but I do think that the, the point is that decisions are going to be pragmatic. They're going to be based on on obviously first what's best for Kenya, what's best for um, the sort of continued growth of infrastructure in the country, which obviously at present is entirely funded by by the Chinese. Um, and I think maybe future negotiations with China need to be focused really on, on yeah, re renegotiating these current repayment packages. Kenya's just moved into a, as as a middle income economy, it no longer is eligible for for um you know the 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 debt uh, relief that China has offered many other countries on the continent. So that makes it an additional challenge. Um, I'm going to do something really mean and ask my colleague. Dennis Okamwa, who's on the call, who is an economist, to uh, to to speak and see what he thinks on 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 how Kenya can manage its debt more carefully, because I think he does have some thoughts on that. Deno? Yeah, thank you for putting me on the spot like that. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I think what I can add to that is uh, we have seen uh, what the president has said. Uh, you know, even yesterday when he was speaking at the I think, meeting with uh, President Ramaphosa, he he maintained that uh, you know he's increasing um, collaboration with other countries, uh, perhaps access to newer markets that we've not uh, had before. So. As, as you said, rightfully said, of uh, the uh, the main aim uh, uh, for these engagements, I think, is uh, is, is economic. And uh, towards the issue of debt, uh, he said that he'll be focusing on PPPs, that's uh, public-private partnerships, and of course partnering with the private sector to um, conduct some of these uh, projects that he's spoken about. For example, you know the housing projects. Uh, and also he uh, has plans of enhancing you know, tax collection. Uh, he's spoken about uh, uh, increasing the, I mean, enhancing the tax base. Uh, I think we are expecting to see uh, changes in law uh, uh, that will affect, you know, of course, tax. Uh, perhaps maybe next year that will be more uh, clear. And then uh, in terms of austerity measures, you know, when he came into office, he, he spoke about uh, ministries uh, reducing their their budget uh, by 300 billion. Uh, but the fact remains that we still have to borrow. I think uh, that is not in question. We have to borrow because Kenya, of course, in terms of budget, we still have a have a deficit. So on on the one hand, he's spoken about all these uh, sort of projects and trying to lift the um, uh, the, the hustlers and trying to turn around the economy. But on the other hand, he also has to uh, deal with the fact that uh, there is no money and uh, Kenya will still be affected with what's happening uh, globally, apart from the the Russia 
uh, Ukraine conflict, the other uh, other things that are happening, for example, in, in the US, raising of interest rates there, of course, that is causing a lot of uh, uh, anxiety here with, uh, with foreigners, uh, with foreign investors uh, coming out of these developing uh, countries into uh, those markets. And, and of course, we know what's happening uh, with the UK. So it, it'll, be, it'll be quite tough. And uh, we just have to wait and see how he deals with, deals with all this. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Dennis. You're a hero. Thank you so much, Dennis and, and Chris, really. And and I think as he was speaking, I kept asking myself, especially when he talked about widening the tax bracket, the questions of inequalities within the taxes is already <laughs> it's already like a tight belt that we really have to adjust and then to reinforce my thoughts, which is more of telepathy, sort of say, yeah, it's gonna be tough. So I think that was very useful, but but then I'm also hopeful because of the ASEFTA, African Continental Free Trade Area, on the question of whether it's going to be a game changer or not. Um, we don't know yet, but the fact that we have a national strategy right now and we started trading with Ghana and, and, and everything. So maybe that uh, looks a bit hopeful. And maybe what uh, 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 Comrade President Cyril Ramaphosa did yesterday was <laughs> one of those hopeful moments that you are like, oh my God, you should have done this long time ago. But yeah, very useful thoughts. And yeah, I, 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 I like the direction that we are taking. I think hope is the only thing that we cannot lose. But I agree with Dennis and yourself that we need to tighten our belts further. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much, Anwawa, for asking that question and sharing your thoughts. We highly appreciate. Maybe just to open up more to participants, if you have any question or if you like to engage with speakers, uh, take this opportunity. You can either post your question via the chat or unmute yourself and engage uh, with our speakers and experts who have joined this session. So anyone, if you have any question, please feel free to unmute yourself and engage with our speakers and experts who join this session. Maybe still to focus within the issue of debt management, uh, uh, maybe Akiar Malim or, or Professor, do you have anything to add, to share, uh, to add more? Juicy content within the issue of debt management with the Kenya Kwanza government. Akiaro or Professor, maybe do you have anything you'd like to share? Well, um, debt is a burden, self inflicted burden. So the question that comes up is how did Kenya get into that debt mess and who is responsible for it? And having checked that and maybe come to some understanding of how it came to be and who is responsible, then there may be a possibility of figuring out how to deal with it. I think um, the president has tried, said he is going to try and renegotiate the payment um, of the particular the Chinese debt. But the Chinese debt is not the only debt, the other debt. So is he also going to renegotiate those other debts? But the bottom line is, how did we get into that in the first place? Because uh, when you live beyond your means, you end up becoming a slave, whoever you owe to. So there's need for reassessment, review of policies, the rationality behind some of these things, and maybe even the negotiators that we send there to negotiate. Uh, because somebody negotiates and um, signs on what we are being told afterwards could have been negotiated better 
or maybe did not need to get into that kind of trap. So how did Kenya get into the trap of finding itself overburdened with debt that could have been avoided? So the first thing is, first of all, to re-examine everything before you can even say you are going to do. Because until you know everything, then it will be difficult to approach the Chinese, the British, the Americans, the French, the European Union, and said, now we know this and this and this and this. Can we rediscuss the matter in a more favorable, more understandable way? And of course, the emphasis on trade rather than aid is a very good thing. And um, how we get these other people to buy Kenyan, because that's the main thing. And I think we have a few ambassadors out there who are doing their best. Give them credit. They're doing their best to get the countries to which they are credited to buy more Kenyan things. Um, I think we have Ambassador Mudoni uh, Gejohi getting reports almost every day of how she's getting the Chinese to buy Kenyan avocados and other things. And they are buying, but they have agreed to buy. But that uh, trade itself is a good thing to think about. But until you know exactly how you got into the mess, uh, the others will be kind of bandits. So those are my thoughts on that. Thank you so much, uh, <laughs> Professor Masharia, for sharing your, your thoughts. Uh, there's an open question from one of the registered participants. And this question is, the, is directed to all the speakers. And we will appreciate if you can take a maximum of three minutes and sharing your thoughts. And, and I think this session, it will interlink with the, with the current question from Anne Rose. So one of, the, one of the registered participants was asking, how positively, strong negatively will Kenya entry into Eastern Congo uh, affect the diplomatic ties of Rwanda and Uganda? And how will the East Africa East Africa community unites be impacted. So maybe to repeat it again, if I've, I've understood it well, how positively, so negatively, will Kenya entry into Eastern, into Eastern Congo affect the diplomatic ties? And how will the East Africa community unite be impacted? So any thoughts from our speaker, from Akiar, from uh, Professor, from Christopher? Do you have any thoughts to add on this? Also for our participants who join, feel free to unmute yourself and engage in this conversation. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, to, yeah, to start. I think that's what makes this so critical. Um, Firstly, this is a it's an East Africa, you know, joint standby force. So it's not just Kenya going in unilaterally. So I think that's quite important to recognize. But what makes any conflict like this so difficult is that obviously the allegations are that the, there are certain rebel groups within Eastern DRC who are backed by Rwanda. So, but that's you know, Rwanda obviously continues to deny that. So what really matters is 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 the rhetoric that Kenyan forces and, 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 and Kenyan uh, officers use when talking about what they're doing. Um, I would say there's lots of potential risks to, to damage relations with, with Rwanda, but in the, initial, in the initial sense, officially, they are there to maintain peace and, 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 and defeat uh, and assist Monusco in defeating a variety of different forces who have lots of different agendas. Uh, agendas. So I think yeah, there is obviously risks, but in itself, I don't necessarily think it is automatically a, a problem for uh, for relations with Rwanda. Um, I think EAC unity will be a priority for for the for for, for the um, UDA government. So I think that that will be managed hopefully very carefully. Thank you so much, uh, Christopher, for sharing. Uh, maybe another speaker would like to add anything. Um, Kenya has had a lot of interest in the, the Congo, not just now. Uh, from the 1960s, 
uh, when the Kenyatta was trying to negotiate and bring together all the factions that were involved uh, in the chaos. And since it's a long lasting chaos, um, it affects everybody. Uh, when Congo was in a mess, those refugees ended up in Nairobi. So we have a direct interest in this sort of thing. The problems in Rwanda and Burundi, when they, they have chaos, they end up in Nairobi. Now, the trade and the business to be uh, obtained from stability in the area is great. And it is in Kenya's interest to help. And since it appears to be acceptable to many factions in the area, then it is in its interest to help as much as it can to stabilize the whole thing so that the whole region, and I don't think it's Kenya's move is in conflict with anybody. It is, as Crystal pointed out, it is an East African standby force going there. East African standby force, there, there are several standby forces in Africa, but it's said that the, Kenya, the East African one is the best, the, 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 the red, the one that's most ready. So it is not something that is being done out of the blues without thinking. And um, back in April or so, uh, there was President Kenyatta did in the East African context suggest that there should be an East African force going into the Congo. So it is not something that has just happened. It's something that has been thought out the, and they were looking at the modalities of doing it. And of course, there are also those things about command and <laughs> structure, all those things. I think they've resolved them as, um, as a regional body as to how things will be done. And I think there is also an acceptability on the part of the Eastern Congo. Uh, so it is, they are not going to necessarily a hostile area. Of course, there's hostility here and there, but they are not going there as a hostile force. It's a peacekeeping operation. And if they can do it, and even for Rwanda, it's good if they are not there, because then the, the Rwandese do not have to be using their resources and military to do whatever it is that they are supposed to be doing. And their differences with Uganda is another matter. So you have, it's a multi-dimensional issue. And by the time the region decided and agreed that maybe they should send an East African force, of which Kenya is a member, I think the only condition that was put there was Rwanda should not be part of it. The others could be because they have no problem with that. So it is a good thing that has been done um, in this respect. And the expectation is that with time, they will be able, they will help to stabilize the region. And if they stabilize Eastern Congo, the whole of the Great Lakes is stabilized. And that's a lot of business, a lot of stability and it's also security. So in the long run, it's a very positive thing to do. Thank you so much, Professor, for sharing your key thoughts and insights. We highly appreciate it. Uh, Akira, do you have anything to add maybe? I haven't no, um, Christopher and Professor put it um, clearly for everyone. Um, as he said that it's uh, Kenya is going as an East African, block and not as an individual country. So we don't expect much uh, retaliation from Congo or Rwanda, but um, it's something that we should watch closely to see how it unfolds. And the main goal is to re bring peace to the region. And so that's the focus. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, for any participants who are just joining, you're most welcome to our today's session. And now we're in a question and answer session whereby we welcome you to ask your, your question to our speakers or engage directly by sharing your thoughts. This is now an open conversation and you're free to engage. If you have any question, feel free to post via the chat or you can also private chat me or unmute yourself and engage with us. Uh, to engage. Anyone? 
if, if no one comes in immediately, Hi, Aaron. Aaron. <laughs> okay. there is Hadija Abdallah wants to engage. Hadija, feel free to engage. Hi, hi. Hi, Harun. Hi, everyone. Um, hold on, please. Hello, Adija, we cannot yeah, hear you. Sorry, I was uh, asking my colleague to uh, mute uh, his gadget, her gadget, sorry. Um, so it's just a, a wide thought, and I'm not sure if at this point we would have an answer, uh, but uh, just thinking out loud in terms of trying to connect the aspect of uh, CVE, uh, or rather VE, and the aspect of having uh, Congo uh, as part of EAC, considering that the country has been um, had a considerable amount of issues when it, it, it comes to uh, violence. Um, we all know that Congo has enriching, um, like more, it's, it's, it's one of the country with the most mineral ores uh, that makes different kinds of things, uh, computer chips, electric vehicles, among others. And uh, also we cannot um, refuse the fact that most of those mineral resources are owned by private entities that are not uh, of Congo nationals. So I'm thinking out loud, uh, when we talk about CVE, uh, especially on around recruitments and manipulations around uh, economic ties, we tend to only think about Somalia. But I, I'm now thinking, uh, being Congo being part of PSC, it means uh, now there's a, a, like a straight gateway to people in in Kenya and people like in Kenya to Congo, Congo to Kenya. So how how uh, uh, how is it going to be, uh, or how is a threat? around uh, recruitment uh, to violence and how prepared are we as a country uh, to ensure that we have uh, policies on CVE that are actionali actionalized uh, properly, knowing that most of our young people are, 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 have been rendered uh, uh, in, in a quest of despair. Uh, their, their only hope now is on the current Kenya Kwanzaa uh, bottom-up approach, uh, which we are not sure as to when uh, this array of hope to these young people is going to be institutionalized. Uh, so like, do we as a country then need to shift um, our uh, focus to CVE, not only to, to Somali, but then to all other East African countries? Because being in a CVE environment, when we, we direct the issues around CVE, we only talk about uh, Somalia. And we know that uh, we have, uh, other young people being recruited to countries like uh, Mozambique. So um, I'm like, then it means we also need to think wide when it comes to VE issues uh, around the uh, issues of Congo joining the EAC. Hello, Hadika, we are Lucio. Can I hear you? Um, yeah, I think I finished my question, unless I wasn't loud enough. Oh, it's okay. Thank you, thank you so much, Adija. Thank you for sharing the issue of cross-border policy concerning the CV issue. Maybe the, rest, the right person who can engage in this engagement, uh, it's Christopher. Christopher, I don't know, do you have anything to share concerning uh, the thoughts from, from Adija, Christopher? Yeah, thanks. I think um, I think Akia will also have some some thoughts on that based on her work with Strong Cities Network. But yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. I would I would say that it, I could talk about that for 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 a long time. So I'll try and keep it short. But ultimately, most of the the problem, and most of the rebel groups, and, and most of the many many militia groups in Eastern DRC aren't violent extremist organisations. They are. Um, uh, rebel groups for rebel causes or or, or criminal enterprises um so and, and they're driven by very much local issues and they wouldn't have any interest in coming to kenya however it's the it, so the only really relevant group here is is the adf or what's known as uh islamic state central africa province um and yeah i, I think absolutely it's really worth it, important that kenya starts considering recruitment from from kenya into 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 groups in other parts of the region not just into into al shabaab or into islamic state uh, somalia um obviously kenya has a huge number of CVE programs in country and both government and civil society run initiatives. And they don't only look at to be uh, they don't only look at look at Somalia. I think all the work that Rusi does, for example, looks very broadly at all forms of recruitment. 
into groups all over the world. So, um, but I, I think the point that that we need to be more, you know, wary of of letting in, uh, of, of sort of opening up the EAC into a, into a into new new countries that have many many different problems that the EAC hasn't experienced before, is a really interesting point that's really really worthwhile um, uh, thinking about, especially for this for this new for these new authorities. Um, that, that 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 would be my initial thoughts. I, I'm sure, as I said, at Strong Cities Network, are, 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 you know, are doing a uh, work across the region with through a new hub, um, working on um, uh, on building sort of city level capacity to deal with these with these threats. But so I thought maybe Aki, I might have some other thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Christopher. Aki, maybe do you have anything to add? Um, yes, yeah, so um, through the Strong City Network, we uh, capacity build local government uh, through um, sharing best practices across the region and looking at what has worked, what hasn't worked in the trends um, across uh, CVE. But our main focus is prevention rather than countering violent extremism within the region. Um, so it's it's something to look at um, as the as the Kenya Kwanzaa government looks ne needs to look at the soft approaches in preventing um, violent extremism within the country and also looking at as we go to do the peacekeeping mission in Congo, what are the consequences? The consequences of um, going to that mission. And uh, as Adija said, I think mostly main, our main focus has been in Somalia and looking at Shabab and the effects of acid preventing that. So it, it will be interesting to see how the new CVE, PVE policy will change and how um, the Kenyan government will use more soft approaches to deal with this uh, issue, but also focus at mainly uh, capacity building and giving more resources to the local government so that um, it trickles down to the grassroots levels and prevention happens from there to prevent recruitment to this uh, uh, groups. Thank you so much, Akiar, for sharing those kind of uh, best practices from the Strong City Networks. We highly appreciate. I can see also there's a question uh, via, via the chat box from um, Jalim Ibra from Jalim Ibrahim. Jalim um, Ibrahim is, is asking. Um, Jalim Ibrahim is ask, is asking. Violent extremism is among the key challenges at the coast of Kenya. Do you think that disbanding DCR's special service unit is the way to solve extrajudicial extrajudicial killing across the country? The question is is directed to to Christopher from Rossi. Maybe Harun, before Christopher answers that, I just wanted to throw in my few thoughts on your previous question. But of course, through you, the chair. Okay, sure. Thank you so much. I just wanted to throw in my few cents, um, especially on the previous question asked uh, by Aridia about now Congo coming into the picture and looking at what we already have or what we don't have. I am also thinking in terms of the legal uh, backing or the legal grounds, we already have that. It will just be interesting to see how that is going to be implemented because, well, it's one good thing that we look at Somalia and we already implementing soft approaches toward PCV, but also looking at what we have in terms of policy, like um, the ESC protocol, on youth peace and security has a whole aspect on PCV. And then if you look at the UN Security Council 2250 and the government of Kenya, for instance, sort of have heavily invested in 1325, which mothers uh, 2250. So it'll be interesting to see how those uh, already existing legal frameworks are going to work or not work for us. And also the AU framework um, on, on YPS, and now also looking into the issue of early warning system, early response. And I know the question has always been, oh yeah, people report, and then we need to strengthen the feedback mechanism and all these things. We, the various uh, EU systems across the regions. 
yeah, I think that's a good thing to look at because I know EGAD C1 has one and the ESC has another one and, and COMESA has theirs. And so maybe apart from the question of harmonization, how will this already establish um, you know, frameworks are going to support the architecture for the new discourse that we're embarking on to. But then the other question also, apart from building the capacities, which as uh, somebody else already talked about, will be maybe um, having more resources into research to see what new pathways are there. And then I'm also concerned as a follow-up answer with the question of SSR, security sector reforms, and what impact or bearing that is going to have uh, on the same question that was asked. Thank you so much, Haru. Thank you so much. Maybe, Christopher, would you like to, to, to engage to that other question? Yeah, um, and Rose, there are some really interesting points there as well, uh, but I won't build on, on those. I think broadly talking about sort of harmonization of regional structures. I think there's already, as you say, enough structures in place that we just need to make sure that they're actually being implemented and that there's funding behind them at a regional level. And I think to a degree, again, Strong Cities Network are doing some work to try and bring together sort of regional CV strategies with, with national and then sub-national plans. Um, but yeah, on the question about DCI's disbandment of the of the um, special service unit, I think my my basic answer to that question is yeah, it's it's definitely a step in in in, uh, in the right direction, if nothing else, to recognise that there is a problem with extrajudicial violence and 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 enforced disappearances. So the fact that this government, this new government, has actually made a big point of in its manifesto of recognising that the the, the 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 connection between um, police brutality and 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 recruitment and and is is a really important step and to be open and, and honest about that. I think you know just disbanding an entire unit isn't always the solution. Sometimes it's better to actually integrate and facilitate change within the within the team. Um, and obviously, if those same individuals who are responsible for that go somewhere else and conduct you know are still responsible for the same the same levels of violence, then that's not going to be an improvement. The other thing is research that we conducted last year in Kuali um, showed that most people don't actually even un understand the differences that most sort of at-risk youths don't understand the differences between different security forces anyway so it's all level all state there's all state security forces uh, are opposed and are hated so it, um, in that case uh, it might not actually make a difference to the relationships but one of the big challenges was that local police face in, in on the coast in Kenya is is not actually being aware of what's going on at a higher level. So the the ATPU and the special service unit would often be responsible for 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 say assassinations in theory, but the local police force wouldn't be aware of what had happened or who was involved because those police forces were those those officers were were plain clothes, for example. So. Um, one really important thing that needs to be done is better communication between the different law enforcement agencies. So I suppose my my yeah my my basic point is that it's a, it's definitely a, a step in the right direct, re direction to recognise that there's a big problem and the special service unit may have been responsible for some of that problem. But there's obviously a lot more to be done to improve relationships between law enforcement and and youths in, in, in on the Kenyan coast. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Christopher. I can see there is another question from Elizabeth Maloba from the chat uh, chat book. Elizabeth uh, Maloba, she's saying that I was recently at a forum where three challenges were identified as facing as facing Africa countries, and these are quite evident in Kenya. One, slow economic slow economic recovery after pandemic. Two rising energy prices, and three, high levels, high levels of surrogate debt. So how is our new foreign policy contribute to enabling the country to respond to these challenges? Maybe allow me to redirect this question to Professor. What's, what's your thoughts or suggestion or recommendation according to this question from Elizabeth Maloba? Thank you. One, the new government is very new. Still uh, trying to find its footing because uh, 
And because it's trying to find, it find its footing, it's been making some blunders here and there, a few blunders. Uh, like when um, President Ruto made a mistake of saying he was going to throw out the Sahrawi only to countermand his own statement. Come back and say that. That was a mistake, yeah? Um, so there is need for a review, first of all. Yeah. Of where Kenya is with regard to every aspect of its foreign policy. It has a new team that has yet to be accommodated, the new PS for foreign affairs and the new whatever, all the pieces are not in yet. And these are the people who help to fashion or steer what becomes policy. So President Ruto has started very well. Uh, he's making a very good image. I think his um, relations with uh, Ramaphosa uh, looked very good there. Eh? To the point where Ramaphosa came and said, now you can go to South Africa without a visa. It should have been done a long time ago. <laughs> uh, the, in fact, it was South Africa that was dragging its feet because Uhuru had said, African countries, you can come. Same way. But it had to be reciprocal. And we know that South Africans have been coming to Kenya without visas. <laughs> you know, you don't have to go line up and ask for. So it was a good thing for him to say, now you reciprocal. <laughs> so we look at the Ruto foreign policy as it evolves, but it, it has to come from deep reflection, not just knee-jerk things. So his foreign minister of foreign affairs, uh, Alfred Mutwell, very good spokesman, he used to be government spokesman. He talks very well. <laughs> and he's got a few people who are advising him here and there and uh, linking up with our security uh, establishment as to the threats that may or may not be there. And they come in different ways. And then his vision, because ultimately foreign policy is driven by the vision of the president. So whatever his vision is, it needs to be clear. And the, his team is the one that has to come up with this. He's got Monica Juma there as an advisor, you know, a national security advisor. And she was minister of defense, minister of foreign affairs and she was PSs. So, they, but these people have not come up yet with a recommendation, a proper recommendation of what the direction is going to be. And since he would like to have his own direction, not to follow Kenyatta's direction, of course, the essence of Kenya's foreign policy is not going to change very much, but the nuances and the direction are likely to take a different um, bearing to have the root <laughs> stamp that has yet to be seen because he has yet to reevaluate everything to assess and then see the way to go i think it started well when it came to education eh? so create a commission review the whole thing uh, although his minister messed up the other day by saying he was going to <laughs> almost close the universities by making you know the, this knee jerk statement by ministers who are yet to find their bearing are doing damage to Ruto in terms of domestic and even foreign policy because they are connected. And when people hear something done, said over that, say he said what? And he was, who is he? And then, oh, he's a minister. What does that mean to the country? What does that mean to the neighbors? Let me say something about Congo. Because sometimes we scatter around things. Eh? The fighting in Congo has been there since 1960. It's not new. And the factions there, the militias, they are funded by forces. Those who are mining <laughs> minerals there and taking them out. Sometimes we fail to address that issue. The sponsors of the chaos. Yes, we can take troops there and they keep the peace because that's what they are supposed to do. But it will not end until the issue of the sponsors of the chaos is addressed. And sometimes the sponsors of the chaos 
are also the donors sometimes. So how does East Africa try to deal with the Congo mess address this, especially the role of the sponsors who sometimes pretend to be donors? Once we, the, the region deals with that, there's troops being there, these, these are functionaries. Huh? But the logic, the philosophy behind all these things needs to be addressed. And in, maybe Ruto in his foreign policy, we need to think about that. It's not enough to send troops there if the root of the matter is not addressed. So that's my comment in those areas. Thank you so much, uh, Professor, for sharing some of your big thoughts and insights. We highly appreciate with your, with your wisdom. And I can see that we have remained with only five minutes from my side. So to wind up this session, I just have like a last question and this will be in a form of recommendation. What's, what is the role of young people or how best can the government uh, promote the role, of, the role of young people in the regional and foreign diplomatic relation. I don't know if I, I have crafted well, but someone is asking more, how can young people engage the, themselves at the regional or foreign diplomatic engagement? Lastly, we'll appreciate also if each speaker can give his or her final parting shot. Thank you. So two minutes each. So we can start with Akiar, Christopher, then we finalize with Professor. Um, Harun, sorry, I'm experiencing internet connection. Could you repeat the question? Okay, the question is more of how best can young people engage themselves in these diplomatic issues? And lastly, what's your parting shots or what's your, uh, your final recommendation for this session? Thank you. Um, so to answer the first question and how the best way to involve the youth or engage them will be to first of all, to provide avenues and spaces where we cultivate a culture of um, mentorship of the youth from the older generation to the new. Um, also having best practices of engaging the youth on issues of foreign policy. Um, that will be the best way to engage. It's just not, um, what I've seen in most spaces is we tend to, have the same faces of youth engaged in the same issues. Um, and, and so it's, it leaves out uh, the, the grassroots levels youth are not rich. So, but it's also important to educate them in the fields of diplomatic skills as a means to achieve global peace. Uh, despite their significant in demographics and economy, we, they have little voice towards global peace policy and so yeah it's important to create those avenues teach them the skills have them provide mentorship um for them so that they can grow because the, we are the future the future leaders of this country and if we don't have those platforms then who do we leave this country to um parting short of this um what for me will be it will be as the professor said that it's a new government just nearly doing its 100 days so i look forward to seeing how the foreign policy changes what strategies they bring in how do they adapt to the new trends and challenges that are coming up climate change um how do we foster uh regional peace how do we take advantage of the different economic uh blocks to advance um so that's what I'm looking forward to. And that's my parting shot. Thank you. 
Thank you, Kiara. Uh, Christopher. Thank you. On the on the first question um, about in, in involving young people in, in politics and in, in foreign policy, I think the first thing is uh, informal networking on, on one level, and that's why I think the work you're doing, Har Harun, is so important. It's great to see, like you, you said, people joining these events from all over the place and all over the world. So I think you know, that that's really that's really important as well. Sort of keeping youths connected in in sort of debate around important issues. Um, but secondly, I think you know involving them. Politicians need to involve youths in decisions they make, uh, and and too often around the world that doesn't happen. Um, they need to be talked to, and there needs to be dialogue, and that also maybe involves. Um, in, in in parts of sub-Saharan Africa where there's this massive youth bulge and lots of the voters are now very young. It means not voting in old politicians who have been around for every, forever. It means voting in new, young, fresh ideas. Um, but that's a, a, you know, a, a big, big ask. Um, as for parting shots, um, firstly, I just wanted to, uh, as, a, as a parting shot, answer the question that someone's asked there on MPS. I think the, um, the autonomy granted to the MPS through... Um, uh th through the move the moving of the of the command structure um away from the office of the president is a really critical and important move obviously there's still opportunities for corruption always but uh i hope it is a you know it, it's a, it's, a, it's an important um security sector reform change uh, that will hopefully lead to to a sort of a, a more at least a less political police force moving forward um but my party shots as for priorities for the for foreign policy i wanted to say i think something that professor macharia Menene said was really critical which is is not rushing into these decisions and that's really important there's a lot of you know don't suddenly rush and make there's a the world is so divided right now and i think kenya could easily um and as as with any country put itself in a very difficult position if it um jumps onto one side and not and and i think it needs to sort of wait and um and and balance the, its own needs um we need to we need to think about as 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 uh, as i think the government is trying to think about what kenya needs at a time when there's very little money and very little funding anyway um and the final thing that i just want to remind everyone because we didn't talk about it at all today we spoke about drc and i think I think in this next five years, the real, really important issue is going to be Somalia, not the DRC. It's what happens when the Amazon mandate uh, or the Atmos mandate expires, and can, and Kenyan troops are forced out, and and there's you know, a huge number of debates around the future of of peacekeeping and state building in Somalia. Thanks, Karen. Thank you so much, uh, Christopher, for sharing the report shot and sharing some of these deep insights we appreciate. Uh, finally, to Professor Masharia. Uh, thank you. Um, as for what can be done for the youth to be involved, you go back to baby class. That's where you start. And you get them acclimatized to being aware of what's going on. Uh, learning about their culture, their history, their whatever, and learning how to ask questions all the time and not to take things for granted. That's where you start. And by the time they get to the university, these are very versatile people and they're not going to allow nonsense to take place because they ask. So there is that requirement. It's education, nothing else. From baby school to the universities. It is a tragedy that People graduate in Kenyan universities without studying Kenyan history. It's a tragedy. And therefore, they, they have no idea what the hell is going on. We even have people in policy making positions who have no idea what Kenya's interests are. And yet they're there. So how come that happens? It's because somewhere along the line, the education ladder, something went wrong. So we need to fix that from the baby school to the university. And once the youth are exposed to that, They'll take care of themselves. They'll know what to do. So starting short, I think everyone needs to be aware and do whatever is possible to know what Kenya's interests are. And whatever happens in discussing with those other powers, Kenya's interests come first, Kenya Kwanzaa. Eh? <laughs> so it's not the American interest. It's not the Chinese interest. It's not the British interest. It's not the Russian interest 
or the EU interest is Kenya's interest first. So once everybody gets that picture properly, then we can be comfortable that things will be done properly. Without that, they're going to be messed up. That's my starting shot. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Masharia, for sharing uh, your parting shots and sharing. Uh, for some speaking this call, engaging and sharing your thoughts, we are highly appreciate. Also, on. Um, also, I would like to appreciate uh, some of our partners who decided to, sup to support me in hosting this sixth, se sixth session. I started this uh, immediately after election in September. So, so I've been hosting session from September, October, and now we're about to, to finalize this sixth session. Thank you so much, everyone, for those who have been joining since the beginning until now in our volunteerism base. We are highly appreciate. Before you leave or before we end this session, I will appreciate if we can take a good group photo. So what I'm requesting is to turn on your, your video and put that awesome, awesome smile. Uh, this uh, group photo, we'll use it for the publication purpose. So please, if it's possible, we'll appreciate if you can turn on your video. Then my colleague, uh, co-host from the Horn of Institute, can help to take the group photo and let us know if you you are ready or or managed. So we'll appreciate if you can take a, you can turn your video on for a quick group yes, photo. I'm ready, Harun. Okay, we're still waiting for some extra participants to turn their video on. Make sure you put that awesome, awesome smile. We'll appreciate to see your, your smile. Yep. All right. Thank you, guys. So um, thank you. Guys. Did you take the photo already? Yes. I was just going to get my gloves. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay. Thank you so much, guys. Just a quick announcement. Uh, so far, we, we've managed to cover six sessions, and, and I'm looking for editorial team. So if you're good for transcribing session, if you're good in content management and content management or development, I'm looking for individual who can support in you know, a volunteerism base. So if you need to engage, uh, you can engage with me via email, and I will engage with you how best we can engage each other our, our main goal is to document all six sessions to harvest key insights and develop uh, a brief learning document with, with these learning issues, insights, and recommendations. So if you're so good on that and you like to be part of the team on a volunteerism base, I highly welcome you and I highly invite you uh, to join me. So uh, I'm just posting my email, then you'll get in touch. So that's my email. You can send me an email and I will get in touch with you. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. And see you next round. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.